Now we're ready to talk about Stokes theorem. So uh, a little bit of review. So the curl of a vector field is about the tendency of a fixed particle to rotate within a vector field. So if you just put a small particle in a vector field, what would, would it want to rotate? And on what axis of rotation would it be? That's what the curl tells us. So it's, again, it's general, different from the general rotation of the entire vector field. Like if you look at it from back afar and you look at all the arrows and you see, hey, it looks like that vector field is kind of rotating or, around. It's about a particle within there, not the actual overall thing. So the following calculation gives you the axis vector about which a particle in space tends to rotate. And we can, we've seen this before. The curl of a vector field F is given by um, sort of the cross product of that del operator and the vector field. I guess one thing I, I didn't say on here is that F is, uh, our vector field F is defined by the component functions M, N, and P in the X, Y, and Z locations respectively. Okay, so we've seen Green's theorem again, and these are just basically copied and pasted what we've seen before. So the general circulation curl form of Green's theorem. Uh, so our criteria is that we need C to be a simple piecewise smooth closed curve oriented in the counterclockwise direction, uh, enclosing a region R and F is a vector field defined on and differentiable in the interior of R. Then the counterclockwise circulation of our vector field F around this curve C is given by the line integral shown there. And we see that we can turn that line integral into a double uh, integral. And that double integral is over that curl calculation of F. And instead of integrating over the uh, curve, the line integral curve, we then integrate over the interior of that curve. So in, if you had the curve was just the unit circle, and that would be our, your line integral. And then over here, the double integral, we'd be integrating over the interior of that unit circle region. And the other version of Green's theorem applies to the flux uh, integrals that we've seen before. And that takes a flux integral and turns it into a double integral, again, over the same conditions, the interior region enclosed by the curve uh, of the divergence of F. And as a reminder, divergence of F, vector field F is equal to that NABLA operator dotted with our vector field. Okay, what Stokes theorem is, is a generalization of Green's theorem to three space. And so it takes line integrals and well, what, what Green's theorem was. So <laughs> let me try again, Stokes theorem. Stokes theorem is a generalization of Green's theorem to three space. And it ends up relating line integrals to double integrals, just like Green's, but in a different way. So Green's theorem relates clockwise circulation of a vector field around a closed simple curve C in the plane. It takes the line integral and turns it into a double area integral with an area differential. Whereas Stokes relates the counterclockwise circulation of a vector field around the boundary of C. Notice it's a boundary C. C is an oriented, it's a curve that's on an oriented surface in space. And it takes and turns that line integral into a surface integral. To apply Stokes theorem, we need our surfaces to be piecewise smooth, in other words, joined up by piecewise smooth curves. So here's the actual theorem statement. Here's the criteria. If our surface S is piecewise smooth, oriented surface with a piecewise smooth boundary C, and our vector field F is, has continuous first partials on an open region containing our entire surface S, then the circulation of a vector field F around our curve C in the counterclockwise direction with respect to the orientation of the surface. That's the difference of greens. Greens required it to kind of be in the plane where now we're letting the surface be up in space. So the counterclockwise direction is with respect to the orientation of a surface S. And so a positive orientation would be is if you walked in a, we're walking on the curve, uh, which is the boundary of the surface uh, and, and you're the, the normal vector that orients our curve is on your left, that would be considered clockwise, counterclockwise, the usual orientation. And so it takes that circulation integral, uh, the line integral that we've seen, and takes it and turns it into a surface integral over the domain of integration, the surface that's enclosed by that curve C, and we integrate the curl of F 
uh, dotted with our surface area differential. Okay, so a few things we may need to do this. If we have our surface given to us as some constant w is equal to, it's a function of x, y, and z, then the gradient it will be normal to the surface. Uh, gradient we've seen in two dimensions, the gradients uh, orthogonal to level curves, and in three dimensions for a function to find a surface defined like this, the gradient is going to have three components and it will be normal to that surface. So a unit normal could be found by taking the gradient and then scaling it by its length. If you have a parameterization of a surface given in the form of um, vector valued function r of u and v, as we've seen before, a normal vector unit normal can be used found by taking the cross product of the partials and scaling it to unit length. Note that as uh, we saw when we were exploring surface integrals, oftentimes this, this, uh, this denominator kind of reduces away with respect to the surface area differential. So it makes the calculations a little bit, They're not easy, I'm not saying that, but a little bit better. So let's talk about this. Since the curl of F is a, the cross product of the del operator with our vector field, it's going to output a vector field. The curl outputs a vector. Uh, so when we apply Stokes' theorem, what we end up doing is we're doing a surface integral of the resulting vector field, the vector field that is the curl. As such, we can use the same methods that we did for evaluating surface integrals. So to do to use and apply Stokes' theorem, uh, as we did before, we parameterize the domain of integration, the surface, and we use a parameter uh, vector valued parameterization boldface r with two parameters and a domain for those parameters. And then we orient our surface that we've just parameterized by choosing our normal vector. We can find a normal by taking the cross product of the partials and then again, pay attention to the problem statement to choose which quote unquote direction of that normal is gonna be the appropriate one for our orientation. Then to evaluate the parameterized surface integral, we have to just calculate the pieces of it. So we're gonna need the curl. And so in order to do the curl, we better first evaluate F in terms of our parameterization. And once you know that value, then you're gonna dot that with the cross product of the partials. And then this whole expression, that dot product again, will give us a, a the dot product of those two things will give us a scalar function, which we know how to integrate over that region R. Now notice again, it's the, uh, the domain of the parameterization. So let's work through an example and, and let's not just do one side of the theorem, let's do both sides. Let's verify that the line integral and the double integral in Stokes theorem agree for this curve C, which is parameterized by R of T. All right, so let's work an example. We're gonna take a look and confirm that both the line integral and the double integral in Stokes theorem agree for uh, this given setup. We're gonna look at a curve C that's parameterized by R of T is equal to cosine of T sine of T and one. And we can see from that, that we're gonna be working with a, uh, since C is equal to one here, we're gonna have, uh, we can just focus on, it's gonna be in the Z equals one plane and we could focus on uh, X cosine y sine, it's gonna traverse that unit circle floating up in the c is equal to one plane in the anti-clockwise direction, so we're good. Um, and the surface s is the portion of z is equal to e raised to the negative x squared minus y squared. That is enclosed by c there. Our vector field that we're gonna use is going to be negative y x one. So we can see a little graph of that surface right there. And we'll take a look at, first we'll look at the line integral and then we will work with the surface integral, or double integral rather, uh, same jazz. All right, first we'll tackle the line integral of the vector field, uh, negative y x one over the curve C given by R of T is equal to cosine T sine of T and one. Uh, we know the line integrals are of the following form. Uh, so in our case, we need to find those values. So the first thing we'll do is we will uh, evaluate our field at our parameterization. So when we had negative y, um, that became negative sine of t. And when we have x, that is, uh, I'm sorry, for the, let me start that over. In yellow, 
the uh, x coordinate of our field is given by negative y. Our parameterization for y is sine of t, so our field evaluated at our parameterization is negative sine of t. For the y component of our field, it is x, and that is given by cosine of t in our parameterization, so cosine of t becomes our y component. And then last but not least, there's not much to do since one is a constant in the z component. Sorry, all this uh, highlighting is going to disappear. All right, so now we take the derivative of our parameterization. Uh, our parameter t is in, uh, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, derivative of sine is cosine, and derivative of one is zero all with respect to t. Now that we have that, we can take the dot product of those two things, giving us uh, negative sine times negative sine gives us sine squared, cosine times cosine gives us cosine squared, and then zero times one gives us plus zero, which I omitted from writing, you know. You just imagine a little plus zero there. Uh, sine squared plus cosine squared is one. I think that's going to help us out quite a bit. So we'll go ahead and simplify it that way. And then looking at our line integral, we have that our line integral becomes from zero to two pi of one dt, which gives us two pi. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention or write down is that for this parameterization, let's get a pen, we know that t varying from 0 to 2 pi is going to generate the entire curve. All right, so there's our line integral. We know that the answer we're looking for is going to be 2 pi. So let's see if we can get there with a double integral. All right, so tackling our surface interval for our vector field over the surface s, that is our same surface z is equal to negative x squared minus y squared. That's enclosed by c. The first thing we'll need to do is parameterize this surface. We take a look at the double integral in Stokes' theorem. Things we're going to need, we're going to need the curl of f evaluated at our parameterization, and then we're going to need a normal vector to our surface by taking the parameters, the cross product of the partials of the parameterization. So let's see what's next. Oops. Okay. So to parameterize this, we are going to use uh, cylindrical coordinates, basically polar coordinates in the plane. R is x is equal to r cosine of theta, and y is equal to r sine of theta. And that gives us that for our d component, e is going to be equal to negative r squared, because this is negative x squared plus y squared. And we know that in polar coordinates, x squared plus y squared is r squared. OK. Uh, Worth noting, we should note the domain of the parameterization. We're going to let r vary from 0 to 1, and theta vary from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, notice that even though we're using r again, this parameterization is not related to, um, when I'm talking about r, I'm talking about the vector r. Uh, it's not related to the parameterization from our prior line integral. It's a different parameterization of a different surface, whereas that was the curve, this is the surface. OK, so now we need to make sure that we are oriented correctly. Let's grab out a pen. So we'll take the cross product of the partials of our parameterization. Um, that gives us, for the x component, 2r e raised to the negative r squared times cosine of theta. And then for the y component, 2r e to the negative r squared times the sine of theta. And then for the z component, we get r. So now we have to ask, is this oriented correctly? Um, it's fairly hard to plot vectors in GeoGebra. If you know how, great. Um, getting them to start and end at the, the right place can be a little bit of a task. So instead of doing that, I'm going to propose that we just kind of evaluate this at, an, at a point and kind of look at it and think about what that's going to mean for us. So, oh, I don't know. Let's just go ahead and grab a, grab a pen here. We're going to choose r is equal to 0 and theta is equal to 0. I guess instead of writing it that way, yeah, that'll be fine. So then uh, let's just go ahead and label this as n. That way I can write that shorter. So n of r comma theta 0 comma 0 is going to be what? Well, 2 times 0 in for r doesn't matter about the rest of that stuff. So that's going to give us 0. And similarly, plugging in 0 for those r down there, we're going to get 0 for the x and the y component. And the only thing we have to worry about is um, the z component, which ends up being zero. So this was a poor choice, but that's okay. Every once in a while, when you wing it, uh, we make little mistakes here. So hang on a second, we'll just do a new one. Let me clear this out real quick. 
All right, so let's take a look at, and this time let's consider instead choosing, let's use, uh, we'll name, again, we'll name this N. So for shorthand, I can write this as N. And we're gonna choose one comma pi over two. I'm not gonna do the exact values here, but if we plug in one for R, and then pi over two for theta, but cosine of pi over two is going to give us zero. So that's gonna make our x component zero. Sine of pi over two is gonna give us one. So this is gonna determine the y component here. When we put one in for r, we're gonna get two times one over e. No, one over e is one over two point something, two over two point something. Okay, point here is it's gonna be a little less than one, and it's going to be positive. So we're just gonna say a small positive value in that direction, in the y direction. And then last but not least, we're gonna plug in one for um, r. Okay, if we try to sketch this out and forgive my dodgy sketch in here, but I'll try x, y, and z. Let's just go ahead and put our curve floating around kind of in the z is equal, or that, that plane up in the air. Uh, and then we'll sort of have that little hump shown there. And then there, there's kind of our surface. Um, so at the point when r is equal to one and theta is equal to pi over two, if we we're just focusing on being in the x, y plane, and that would put us at radius of one, pi over two gives us right up on that y axis. So right here on the y axis, that would put us, and then if you put us onto our curve and put us right above, um, the one on the y-axis on our surface. And so since our vector would not go anywhere in the x direction and it would go a small positive direction in the y direction and one up in the z direction, it's gonna look something like this. Well, that's sort of helpful. That suggests we have an upward pointing normal and that's, that's good because that's what we had in the last situation too. But maybe we were like, well, I don't really know how that relates to imagining the normal if I were to um, walk around on this curve in the anti-clockwise direction, it should stay on my left-hand side. So let's, instead of making that a radius one, let's just consider down here what would happen if we, oops, not r, but normal, uh, we made r one half and pi over two. By a lot of the same logic we had above, we would get zero comma, a small positive value. And then in this case, instead of having one, we'd have one half. So our vector would probably be somewhere right above, but the, if that was one on the y-axis, half would put us probably right about here. It looks like it's probably gonna be a little shorter, but it's still gonna be upward. And as I walk and traverse this curve in the anti-clockwise direction, kind of in the Z uh, plane there, um, that normal is gonna be on my left-hand side. So we are happy with our orientation. Yeah, so just do a, a quick sketch and kind of intuit your way through and say, okay, yeah, I do have the, uh, the parameter, the rather the normal oriented correctly. All right, so now we need to find all the values that we're gonna need. Oh, wait, what did I? Yep, it's worth, we mentioned it, but we, uh, well, that didn't show up, so. Uh, we mentioned it already, but it's worth pointing out that we already have the, the domain for parameterization decided, because we'll need that eventually. Most notably, that's what's R. R is the domain of our parameterization. It's no longer the surface. So what do we need? We need the curl of F and then we need it that dotted with that normal vector that we see. So we've got the normal vector from last time. Now we need the curl. So evaluate our parameterized surface integral. In order to do that, first thing we do is we're gonna calculate our curl. And since the curl is calculated as uh, that nabla operator crossed with our field, we would have i hat, j hat, k hat, etc. I like to use this method to find the um, to find cross products. Uh, so we have all the partials del x, del y, and del z. Uh, and if you keep going, it doesn't make sense to put r cosine of theta or something like that involving r and theta down here. Since our cross product involves nabla, we want to use the original vector field, which if I am not mistaken is 
something to the tune of negative y x one. So it would be negative y x one and then so forth and so forth. When you do that calculation, you'll end up with zero, zero, two. But what I was trying to say there is calculate the curl f before you find out what f is evaluated at that. So perhaps this was kind of uh, interesting notation and perhaps more, oh no, more accurately it should be. What do we got going here? Come on, little internet. Okay, maybe it should be something like this. Curl of vector field f evaluated at r, but now we're just kind of playing with notations and getting it more complicated than perhaps it needs to be. Okay, moving on. Evaluate vector field at our parameterization. Okay, let's see. Well, in this case, since our curl here doesn't depend on x, y, and z any longer, we're not gonna, we, we don't need to plug in r cosine of theta for any more that we have x and r sine of theta for y and um, whatever it was for z. So that won't be always be the case. You may have it in terms of x and y, and since you're gonna integrate in terms of whatever your, your um, parameterization variables are, in my case, it would be r and theta or u and v, you would need to evaluate it there and change it into terms of the correct variables. All right, so calculating the integrand, kind of putting this all together, we're gonna to dot the curl with our normal vector. 0, 002 dotted with that complicated stuff. Doesn't much matter because the x and the y component are going to be 0 plus 0. 0, let's see. 0 times 2r e to the negative r squared, yada, yada, yada. Well, those zeros plus zeros just going to kill off the first two terms. So all you have to worry about is that third term, 2 times r. And that's where we get 2r for our dot product. Okay, so now we have our integrand. We know our limits of integration because they are the domain of the parameter. There are. And so we whack 2r in as our integrand and we integrate from r is equal to zero to one and theta equals zero to two pi. 2r integrates as r squared evaluated from one to zero just gives you one. And so then you end up with two pi once you integrate with respect to theta. And that is the end. We're happy with that result because we recall that our line integral also worked out to be two pi. Thanks.